Well, CNN's Nick Payton Walsh joins us live from Zaporizhia, Ukraine, along with senior international correspondent Frederick Plaitin in Berlin and our national security analyst Steve Hall. Good to have you all with us. I want to start uh, with you first, Nick, because uh, this this crash happened two months after the Wagner Group launched this mutiny against the Kremlin. Uh, we're now hearing from the president who has offered his condolences to the family of Prigozhin. What do you make of it? Putin's words are enough to suggest that he's apprised of events and he sort of stumbles when he begins to talk about the preliminary information that suggests there were Wagner personnel on board. And he sort of seems to talk about Yevgeny Prigozhin, both somebody he knew, but somebody who made errors and who is now in the past tense. Let me just quote some of Putin's words. I knew Prigozhin for a very long time, since the 90s. I uh, interject here when they were together in St. Petersburg. He was a man of difficult fate and he made serious mistakes in life and he achieved the results needed both for himself and when I asked him about it, for a common cause, as in these last months. Now, that's an extraordinarily ambivalent way of referring to a man that many people who observed this aircraft tragedy think may be murdered by the hand of the Kremlin. And I think it speaks to the silence we've heard from Vladimir Putin these last 24 hours since that plane crash, where he appears to have let a bit of distance emerge and now step forward with this very ambivalent statement where he offers condolences to the people who he thinks were on board and says there will continue to be an investigation and also hints potentially to parts of the Russian elite who might be wondering what on earth has happened here that he may be more apprised of the situation than they are. When he says, you know, when I spoke to him, he talked about this and that. Let me let you know about exactly where we are in the investigation. We don't know an awful lot of information uh, outside of what Russian officials are telling us. They are clearly saying that remains have been taken away from the area around the crash site. And that's potentially two kilometers wide. That's backed up by satellite imagery that CNN has obtained, showing the wreckage distributed mostly in one place, but in various other locations too. Uh, and at the same time too, uh, all we are relying on at this point are Russian official statements saying that Prigozhin and a remarkable number of his henchmen were on board this same private jet, travelling, it seems, from Moscow to St. Petersburg. A sign, really, that these men who, a matter of two months ago, would have been fully aware that they had challenged Putin's rule in ways not seen in over two decades, the most direct and, at times, armed threat to Putin he'd ever seen, that they were somehow, two months later, moving freely and safely inside of Russia. And they all decided to be on the same private jet. Now, clearly, for reasons we don't fully know the explanation of at the moment, that was a bad decision. There are some suggestions our colleagues in D.C. are supporting, uh, reporting that there are indications that U.S. intelligence are assessing a whole variety of possible explanations as to, indeed, how this plane came down. But the discussion around what happened is focusing, at times, from those in Ukraine, from those in uh, Kremlin... Uh, uh, circles potentially pointing uh, towards Vladimir Putin here because of clearly the enmity he must have felt towards Prigozhin for leading that armed rebellion against him. But still, the calculated uh, sober nature of Putin's comments will remind many of the Putin they perhaps knew a year ago, uh, seeming more in control, um, but clearly who felt uh, still an enduring threat from Yevgeny Prigozhin that potentially, his critics would say, he may have been involved in this plane crash. Linda? Uh, thanks to you, Nick, if you can just stand by for us. Uh, Steve, I want to get uh, some insight from you because we have a long list of people that uh, have apparently potentially been assassinated or there has been an attempted uh, assassination on their life uh, who have either been critics or dissidents of Vladimir Putin. When you look at what has happened here, Prigozhin was not only, not only became a critic of the Kremlin, he was a traitor. Is Putin capable of this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is definitely something that is, is straight out of Putin's playbook. There's, there's really no surprise to that. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think we're ever going to know precisely what happened because Russia is a closed society with no rule of law. And so we won't really get any transparency. But what we're left with, or at least what I'm left with, is a couple of key questions. I mean, the first is, how is this going to be interpreted and in, depending on how the Kremlin spins it? So Putin's comments initially were very, very guarded. Uh, he didn't say a whole lot. Uh, and you wonder whether or not his elite, the Siloviki, 
have they thought, okay, now the real Putin is back, we've got to be really careful? Or have they learned that, okay, it's possible to try what Prigozhin tried? I mean, his troops, after all, did get halfway to Moscow. We just have to be more careful. Is that is that what opponents of, of Putin are saying right now? So we'll have to see what lessons they've learned based on what actions we see and how the Kremlin spins this in coming days. Later. And if it was Putin, Steve, why would he wait two months after a mutiny to do this? Yeah, that's the right question, because I think that's the question everybody's kind of scratching their heads over. Uh, there's a couple of different possibilities. One is that we saw how popular Prigozhin was, at least in places like Rostov and other places that are near uh, the border with Ukraine, where you know they're, they're being impacted by Ukrainian drones and so forth. Uh, so Prigozhin, because of some popularity, it might have been thought by Putin and his, and his assassins that, OK, we need to give this some time. If we turn around and kill him immediately, there could have been you know, some, sort of, some sort of uprising. Uh, the other thing is, is that because Prigozhin got as far as he did, it's possible that Putin essentially had to sit down and figure out with his key security guys, OK, what are we going to do? How are we? This is not just one man. This is an armed unit that, if we kill its head, could come for us. And so they might have had to plan a little more carefully uh, as opposed to it being, you know, one opposition figure like Navalny who they could just throw in jail. Yeah, exactly. And, and Fred, I, w I want to turn to you because uh, there's also the question of the future of the Wagner group. Well, if Prigozhin, the head of this group, was on that plane and his right-hand man, uh, the second in command, also on that plane, listed as a passenger, what does that mean for this group, which is operating in many countries around the world? question, certainly a very important one. And I think one of the things that also feeds into that, Linda, as well, is the importance of the Wagner private military company for the Kremlin, for Russia, for Russian authorities, and also, of course, for Vladimir Putin's power, not just inside Russia, but also, of course, uh, around the world as well, or at least in many places uh, around the world. If you look at some of the things that have happened since that uprising, obviously, the Wagner private military company was an extremely important military asset for the Russians in Ukraine. They were one of the few units that were actually achieving any sort of gains in uh, Ukraine around Bakhmut, despite the fact that, of course, those were very bloody and they incurred some severe losses while doing that as well. At least they could post some successes. That was very important for Vladimir Putin. Then after the mutiny took place, and I think it's so interesting when we look at that statement that Vladimir Putin uh, read or, or the things that he said, if you read between the lines, essentially what he's saying is this, yes, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin did something important, but don't forget, this is a businessman who also got very rich doing that as well. That's the point that Vladimir Putin is clearly trying to make, saying this is not just a martyr or someone who sacrificed himself for Russia. This is also someone who benefited a great deal from the fact that he was getting weapons from the military and money uh, from the Russian state as well. That's also something Vladimir Putin said. What we've seen since then, while Yevgeny Prigozhin was still alive, was a reorientation of Wagner towards more business in Africa. They had some assets in Belarus for a while that really wasn't working out, but they were reorienting towards Africa. And that certainly seems to be the new big area where they want to conduct business. Now, as possibly now, the entire leadership of, of what was Wagner is now decapitated, essentially, especially if Dmitry Utkin, who is that second in command, the, the sort of military leader of Wagner, especially if he really was on that flight as well, I think very soon you could potentially see new leadership of Wagner and then also possibly see them do new dealings as well, because that business in Africa is very important money-wise for the Kremlin, but also as far as political power is concerned as well, with Russia really spreading its influence in that part of West Africa, Linda. Yeah, you make some really good points, Fred. Uh, just one other question that baffles me, I'll go back to Steve on this, is the fact that after the mut mutiny, Putin said Wagner doesn't exist. Uh, Prigozhin had, had agreed to move to Belarus uh, under this peace deal with the Kremlin. Why then would he return to Russia? You know, there, there is so much, Linda, that goes on behind the behind the doors in the smoky back rooms uh, of the Kremlin, so many deals that are cut. And, of course, another lesson that I think people inside of Russia, the power people inside of Russia are learning is, is that, OK, just because you have a supposed deal with Putin, even if it involves going to a neighboring country, uh, you know, don't put all your eggs in that basket because it might not work out as, as well as it's planned. I think with regard to Prigozhin, there's an element of hubris here. We've seen it with some of the other oligarchs.
uh, that didn't end well. Uh, 20 years ago, Hordakovsky is a good example, you know, thought he could pull even with Putin in terms of political strength and ended up spending, uh, you know, 10 years in, in a Russian jail. So, I, I, but there is a certain hubris that sometimes these guys display. They feel like, okay, yeah, I was able to pull this off. I tried something. I didn't suffer anything immediately, so it must be okay. And then the hammer comes down. I think that might explain uh, some of Prigozhin's movements in the two-month interregnum uh, between the initial incident and yesterday. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we've been focusing so much on Prigozhin. I, I want to go back to you, Nick, because there have been some significant developments on the front lines. Uh, we are now hearing from Ukraine that they say they have troops who have landed in Crimea. What can you tell us? Yeah, landed in Crimea. I don't think they're necessarily they're staying there permanently. But on today, Ukraine's Independence Day, uh, Ukraine's defence intelligence have uh, loudly talked about an operation overnight or in recent days, which appears to have put their special forces along the banks of the Crimean Peninsula. That is an exceptionally symbolic part of Russia's occupation of Ukraine, taken annexed in 2014 with rarely a shot fired, uh, and now a place which is very much in the crosshairs of their move in the counter-offensive to try and cut Crimea off from the rest of occupied Ukraine and the Russian mainland. The defense intelligence is suggesting that a series of amphibious landings have hit targets along uh, that Crimean Peninsula's coast, suggesting perhaps as many as 30 Russian soldiers have been killed. It's part of a pattern of their moves across waterways, including the Dnipro River, to try and harass, to attack Russian uh, troop groupings in these sort of waterborne areas. But this Crimea move happening on the Independence Day in terms of its announcement is certainly a way, I think, of uh, Zelensky and his staff to suggest that they will continue to focus on liberating all of Crimea, to continue to harass Russian troops in areas where they might think they were otherwise safe, and possibly an answer, too, to Western critics who talked about how... Uh, Ukraine's focus on the Crimea is misplaced. Crimea is clearly a part of all of Russia's infrastructure in occupied Ukraine. And I think Ukraine would say, well, we're hitting infrastructure there relentlessly because it impacts Russia's ability to defend its front lines on the Zaporizhia front. So a lot moving here, certainly. But above all of that, don't forget, Linda, this discussion of what happened to Prigozhin feeds into the war narrative here. He was Putin's most key confidant, the most aggressive part of Russia's military infrastructure along the Bakhmut front lines and across Ukraine. And the fact now that Ukrainians might choose to interpret these events as suggesting Putin killed one of his own, one of his former closest allies, well, that speaks to what this has really done, this war, to Russia's mindset, to the Kremlin's mindset, given it's not had anything like the swift results it hoped and has seen the slow grind deteriorate its forces here. And even Ukraine's slow counteroffensive really challenged Moscow's ability to hold small parts of territory here. Linda? Yeah. Nick Payton Walsh for us, Al Frederick Plyton, Steve Hall, we appreciate your analysis. Thanks very much.